We're almost live. Oh, we're live. Oh, good. Here we are. <laughs> we're on the air. This is Levi Sim from PhotoFocus.com, and uh, you're watching the this Lightroom Hangout, which we do every month. And uh, going forward, we're we're probably doing it on the first Monday of the month from now on. And so we'll be seeing you here with a much more regular schedule, and that'll that'll help us all to uh, plan a little better for this. And we're glad that you've chosen to tune in. Um, today's show is brought to you by Perfectly Clear, which is a marvelous tool for uh, helping your pictures look their best. And it does it faster and better than I can do it on my own in Lightroom or Photoshop. And it's a plug-in for Lightroom and Photoshop. And that allows us to uh, converse with our photographs, like some of the other uh, methods for adjusting these things does in our pictures. And then if you're a portraitist, it does the most wonderful job of retouching skin. And uh, it's such a marvelous tool. And download the free, uh, the free version of the software, which is called Perfect Exposure. And it's got a wonderful exposure contrast excuse me, exposure contract that, uh, that is really just going to floor you with how well it works. Um, it doesn't desaturate colors as it brightens, which is just an amazing thing. And then we're also brought to you today by Drobo, which, is, which manufactures uh, backup solutions for us, for photographers, so that our pictures remain safe even when our hard drives fail, because they will fail. And the Drobo system helps us to uh, have a solid, I'm looking at my Drobo, help us to have solid backups of our pictures that um, helps us to keep ticking along. And it's so easy to use. You just plug it in and start putting pictures on it. So, and I love using them. Um, and today, so that that's it. Our, our usual, my co-host, Rob Sylvan, is not with us today because he's at Photoshop world kicking off today in Las Vegas, Nevada in the USA. And uh, actually, as, as soon as we hang up here, I'm driving to the airport and heading down there myself. So I, I hope we'll see some of you guys there too. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll keep you updated on what's going on. So excited because I've got just one of the most And Anne lives in Chicago, Illinois. Well, thereabouts. Yes. Probably not in Chicago, Chicago. I live nor north of the city. <laughs> north of the city. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. And Anne, you like to photograph flowers is, is what you seem to have a real penchant for. I do. I do. That is my favorite subject. So um, I consider myself a macro, um, well, a nature photographer, but my greatest love is photographing the world up close. I'm just always fascinated by the details, the patterns, the textures, the, the little things that a lot of people miss. And um, yeah. that's what really drives me to photograph. And flowers are a perfect subject for that. Um, the other piece of it is that I live 10 minutes from one of the world-class gardens of the of the world the Chicago yeah. Botanic Garden so um, I it's my second home in fact people tease me sometimes that I must like to pitch a tent there because I spend so much time there you know usually about five days a week I'm, I'm there sometimes twice a day so wow, um, wow. yeah so when I discovered that place you know all the dots connected for me I um, I grew up in a small town and and spent a lot of time outdoors. I was kind of of that generation that you know played outside all the time, and um, discovering the we material. do that now too. We just use Pokemon to get out there. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but you know, discovering the botanic garden really kind of reconnected me with nature and that love of nature that I had as a child and it just became the right fit for me because I've been photographing since I was 10 years old but um, you know I was photographing just about everything so now I've narrowed my focus to 
to nature, particularly botanicals and flowers up close. So, Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Oh. Uh, today, we've got some prizes to share with you at the end of the uh, not not with you, Anne, but with everybody else who's watching. <laughs> hey, darn! We've got I a drawing for some prizes <laughs> from Perfectly Clear. Yeah. Um, and so, to enter the drawing, what you need to do is ask a question or or leave a comment in the Q and A pod. And here's how you do that. Let me share my screen with you, and I'll show you a little screen capture that'll show you. So here on your screen. Um, or, or for those of you who are already in, this is where we came to. This was our page today. And you'll just press the play button to view, to start watching the video with us. And then once you're in the play button, come up and click on this little grid right up there. And that grid has the Q&A pod in it. Just click this. And then right here on the right side of the screen, your questions will show up. And you'll see everybody else's questions too. You can bump a question to the top by hitting the little plus one button, and uh, and we will go through and, and do our best to answer your questions while we we are discussing today, and by asking also entering the drawing. We'll draw from everybody who asks a question in order to uh, pick who's going to win the full version of Perfectly Clear, and also a couple of uh, perfect eyes licenses as well, which is a, a marvelous tool for making portraits look better. And, and anybody else having that problem, let me know and we will adjust our bandwidth section uh, settings. And well, you can let me know by leaving a question right there too. Go ahead, Ann. What was Oh, I was going to say you—you you are freezing up every once in a while. So am I okay? I'm going to go Is ahead that... and, and change my settings right now. Okay. And uh, there's my settings. We'll see if this. There, and uh, hopefully that helps our our broadcast to look a little bit better today. Um, and with that, and let's get down to it. So what, okay. what, what, what have you got for us? You've got, well, I mean, you've got millions <laughs> of fabulous flowers to show us, but what, what are you looking for? Why don't, why don't you pull up a picture on your screen and, and okay. uh, uh, um, regale with okay. photography for a minute? Um, before I do that, just something that, that you might need to know about me where I come to photography is I come from the artistic side. Um, yes. I have been involved in the arts all my life. In fact, I, um, art was really my thing um, growing up. And I almost decided to become an art major, but then I got a little concerned about how I was going to support myself. So, you know, what does every practical minded young woman decide to major in? Um, anthropology. <laughs> so, um, so I moved away from the arts for a little bit, but I came back to it. Um, I got my master, I ended up getting my master's in art therapy. So a lot of the way that I look at my work and, and look at the world is kind of through those glasses. Um, I worked with young children as an art therapist and um, so I'm always looking for stories in, in my images yeah. and I'm not going to pretend that every image that I create has this deep story behind it but it's it's what I'm really looking for. So one of the things that I love to teach people um, when I do workshops or classes is what I call the art of seeing or learning to see. And I know that that sounds a little overdone. It's kind of a trite statement, but um, I think it is I'm the sorry. essence. What? Whoops. The, what, you were, what you call it. It looked like you what? said the art of learning to see. Is that is that what you said? The art, yes, the art of seeing. The art um, of seeing. Oh, good. Okay. Right. And um, 
I just think this is really the basis of all photography, really, that yeah. we need to slow down and and look at, you know, not just glance at subjects. And, and really, this applies to any photography landscape, um, portrait, everything. Um, look at your subjects, study them, find interesting subjects with character that set your work apart from, from just, you know, the, like when I shoot flowers, um, you'll see a, a, a million flower photographs out there. Um, but what you want to do is create something unique. So this is what I love to teach people um, what to look for. So um, I guess I can share my screen here and yes, um, and show actually, you and before you share your screen. Yeah. Let okay. Me, let me have you change your bandwidth settings too. Oh, so okay. All on right. the hangout okay. window. All right, on the hangout window. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Just hover your mouse over over my face or your face, whoever's showing on there. Okay. And uh, right at the top, you'll see it looks like looks like the four bars for signal. Right. All right. And it says adjust bandwidth usage. All right. Click that. Click on that one. Yeah, and then just pull it down one notch. To okay. the left, so it says medium. Okay. All right. Yeah. And that's yeah. that. There we go. That, that. Thank you. And and now share your screen away. Thank you. And okay. and thanks everybody for helping us keep up on that. Of yeah. course, we log on a half hour before, and all this works great. And then as soon as we hit go, <laughs> it starts acting up. Okay. And while you share your screen with us, Ann. All right. Jack is saying hi, and and Anthony's in the house. Uh, Susan is here and she's already got a question for us and we will okay. answer her question in just a minute. Um, James is here from Erie. Whoops. Carmen from Spain? Wow, Carmen, I don't know if we've had Spanish-based. Whoops, I'm losing you again. <laughs> Uh oh, you're losing me. Oh yeah. man, L Lori, Lori Novak says hi. Oh, Lori, I know Lori. <laughs> Great. Um, and let me let me give you a question from Susan Lash. Okay. She says, "What means do you typically use for processing your photos?" Love okay. your work, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, all right, well, we're going to talk about this towards the end. I'm actually going to process some images for you. Um, I start in Lightroom, and then I do a little bit of tweaking in Photoshop, but very little. Um, but my, my go-to um, plugins are Nick software, Google Nick. Um, I have a couple yeah. of programs within Nick that I absolutely love, and I can show you um, how those really can transform an image from just, you know, a little blah to really having a lot of pop. So um, we're going to talk about that as at, towards the end. Excellent. Excellent. And let's see. Oh, yeah. And James does the same thing. You post-process your photos. I do. I did do minimal post processing. Um, I, I don't right. know if everybody read the um, the Photo Focus article by Scott Bourne yesterday about uh, using plugins and minimal processing. And I just, oh, I applaud that article. I, I thought it was wonderful because I'm on the same page. I'd much rather be out shooting than sitting uh -huh. on my computer. So I make my post processing really simple. I do try to get it right in camera. I work really hard to, to make that happen so that I have to do very little in the end. And you'll be surprised how little. I mean, I think people assume that I'm doing a lot, but I'm not. Um, uh -huh. Very simple techniques. So, Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, good. So show us what you've got here. Okay, well, um, I'm starting with this image, and if you've seen me present, you've probably seen this before, because this this is a zinnia that was uh, snapped upside down, and this goes back probably about 
I don't know, four or five years when I was on a little bit of a journey um, creatively trying to really learn how to see better. And um, I came across this flower and I just stopped at my tracks and I said, whoa, <laughs> look at, you know, this is the underside of a flower <laughs> and look at the incredible patterns, the texture, just the, the lines, everything about it. I was fascinated with. So I, I wanted to capture this image and it was really kind of an aha moment in terms of beginning to look more carefully at subjects and and work my subject. That's a really important part of flower photography is working your subject. You know, I think a lot of people have a tendency to just take one picture and move on. Well, I will oftentimes take a hundred pictures of the same flower. If I take the time to look for an interesting subject, then I want to capture it in as many ways as I can. And I started photographing these zinnias, you know, from the top. That was sort of the way I approached flowers. But it opened a new door for me in terms of really looking at working my subject. So um, this is all sort of part of, you know, what I love to teach in this art of seeing is really slow down. It's um, some people call it contemplative photography. Um, but this is how you're going to find your interesting subjects. Um, what and, I'm and when you when you photograph a hundred flowers or a hundred <laughs> pictures of a flower, you're yeah. not taking the same one over and over, right? No, you're, you're doing no, no, something no, no, different no. for each picture. No, I'm I'm altering my composition. I'm altering my angle. I'm shooting it above. I'm shooting it under. Um, I'm uh, varying my aperture. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I know exactly where I want to be with my aperture, but sometimes I don't, and I want to experiment. So. Um, I don't just stop with one photograph. It, that's pretty mm -hmm. rare for me. Um, I really work my subject. I think it's a, an important part of, of photography in general, but particularly when you're working up close, um, there's just so many possibilities. So um, I'm also, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, Do, are you using a tripod? Uh Oh, that's a good question. Well, I shoot um, I shoot with macro lenses almost exclusively. Um, I use a 100 millimeter macro and a 180, and there are different reasons why I choose each of those lenses. Um, Is that the Sigma 180? No, it's the Tamron. Oh, the Tamron, yeah, yeah. 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 That's a great one, too. And I vary between shooting with a tripod and shooting handheld. Um, uh -huh. depending upon the way I'm shooting. Obviously, if I'm shooting at a higher aperture and, I, you know, I have a lower shutter speed, I'm going to need to be on the tripod. But I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with tripods. <laughs> I love the freedom of being able to move around. And that's one of the reasons I love shooting with my 100 millimeter. It has image stabilization. Right. Um, I like getting close to my subject. Um, so, you know, that, that lens in particular, I can get away with hand holding. In fact, people are oftentimes surprised that, you know, when I show them images that I've actually done them handheld because they are really sharp. But I have right. a steady, I have a steady hand. Not everybody does. And I, you know, I think that's just a very personal choice. Um, a, you know, if you don't have a steady hand, get on a tripod. And the advantage of working on a tripod is it will get you to slow down and compose more carefully. Mm -hmm. um, so um, just a couple of, of other things that I look for in when I'm looking for subjects to shoot is I look for patterns. Um, this is a clematis and normally they're white or purple, but this one I just fell in love with the patterns that it it. Yeah. Had, and so the, the patterns. Our eyes are just incredibly drawn to patterns. So whenever you see an interesting pattern, um, you know that's that's a good subject. Um, here's another azinia that I just was fascinated with because the petals were still unfolding, and I love the contrast of the white unfolding petals against the red. I thought it made a much yeah. more interesting subject than a fully formed flower. Um, flowers are just full of incredible patterns. And here, 
this is a dahlia, but I've shot it in a very non-traditional way. Rather than shooting it from the top, I'm emphasizing those patterns by shooting it from the side. And it's more selective focus. This is a lower shot at a lower aperture. Um, another thing that I look for, and this is a more abstract way of looking at flowers, and that is to look for beautiful lines. And yeah. to do that, you have to get down close because if you shoot tulips, you know that they grow in beds with hundreds, if not right. thousands of flowers. There's, there's a bed of flowers at the Botanic Garden that, that um, when you come out of the visitor center, you see this bed and they have, they plant 26,000 tulips in there. And it's, it's just, <laughs> it's gorgeous. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful, but to really, you know, you, you just kind of see the sea of color, but to really study your subjects, you have to get down and you have to look at them individually because they each have their own unique personality. And the reason I love this flower was those beautiful, beautiful lines. Um, roses, the same thing. I'm, I'm looking at the more abstract quality of just the lines. Of course, the dew doesn't hurt on this one either. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> and this is shot at a, at a higher aperture because I want to capture all those details. I have two well, kind and, of... And talk to us about apertures. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, this is an interesting thing. Um, and, and I guess I just took this for granted because um, until it, actually the Botanic Garden pointed this out to me because they commissioned me to do a big project for the Orchid Show. And they said, one of the reasons we like your work is because you are well versed in shooting very detailed shots as well as very soft focus. And usually flower photographers pick one or the other. They are mm. more comfortable in one realm or the other. But I, depending upon the story I want to tell about a flower, and in this particular flower, the story is about the dew and the lines. Um, I choose my aperture accordingly. So I shoot the whole range. And when I'm teaching beginning macro photographers or beginning flower photographers, I encourage them to shoot at all apertures. Just start at 2.8 and work yourself up to 32. Go home, get it on your screen and look. You'll, you'll learn a whole lot about what your lens is capable of. And you'll also begin to develop a preference and a style for what you like. Um, some people only like very sharp focused images, whereas this is another rose that's very soft. Um, right. And I, I love both. I mean, I just, I, it's not, I don't have a split personality or anything, but I just really love shooting both ways. And it just depends on the story that I want to tell about a, a, a flower and what I want to emphasize as to how I choose. Now that, that looks like a 56 millimeter lens to me. Is that right? Uh, would you be referring to the lens baby <laughs> velvet? <laughs> I would. Is that a velvet picture? Is Actually, it? that is not. That was, um, that was shot with my hundred millimeter, but wow. look, at, um, look, at the, look at the softness, but sharp. You yeah, yeah. I, I, I honestly can't tell you what aperture that was shot at, but I'm going to guess it was sort of <laughs> 6.3. Um, yeah. So again, some, some folks are asking if you'd show us uh, if you'd show us your side your sidebar with the uh, with the camera settings. Oh, oh, of course, of course. Here I can open that. Uh, open that up. Uh, yeah, right sidebar. I'll do it. Yeah, there. Oh, yeah. Here, oh, I'll except just... it's not connected, so it won't do it. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. These actually, are these are JPEGs. If you, if you hit metadata, yeah. Well, and they're on a different drive, so they're not even connected right now. But yeah, uh, um, yeah. Well, I hmm, that's I, I don't know that it's going to show up at all, right? It, it um, will here, yeah. But go okay. up where it says default and switch that to um, right next to the word metadata. Oh wait, here we go. Bar. Here we go. There it is. Uh, yeah, oh. it. Whoa, okay. Now I'm surprising myself here. I really, uh, <laughs> this was actually shot at F29, which is way up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, obviously I'm on a tripod at 1 20th of a second. Um, I think what I did here, um, this is probably from a couple of years ago, uh, was that I added some blur in post processing to, to give it that soft effect. So, um, which you know, loud. you know, it's, which is what? 
it's allowed, you know, however you get to your... Oh, of course. Your yeah. It's, it's legal. Well, there's no um, rules here. Yeah, yeah, and he, and here's another one that was shot. Um, F13 is what I needed to get this ranunculus or Persian buttercup in focus. But again, you can see I added some blur because I'm trying to bring your eye back into mm -hmm. the center of the flower. So here again, you know, it's I'm emphasizing the curves and the the lines of the flower, and. You know, another thing that you'll notice about my work, because I am basically a macro or a close-up photographer, I know there's a slight difference between those two, but um, I fill my frame. I prefer um, simplifying my composition and moving in. So you don't always see backgrounds in my images. Yeah, you haven't shown us one picture with the entire... Yeah, it, um, but I do. Sometimes I pull back. Again, it really depends upon what I, what, you know, each flower has a different story to tell. So you, you'll see some with yes. backgrounds. Um, and, and that's a whole other huge subject in flower photography is, is backgrounds and how we deal mm -hmm. with them. Um, it's one of the most challenging aspects of, of flower photography, and um, I, I could talk for a couple hours just on that. <laughs> right. um, this is another thing that I look for, um, and this is when I really feel like I've hit the jackpot, is I look for flowers that have what yeah. I call personality, yeah. and have um, just a little something different that makes them stand out, and this was... A dahlia uh, I shot last summer and I went through every dahlia in that garden there were probably about a hundred of them and this was the one I chose because I loved the way those petals were curling and twirling right. it's just a simple little story to me this is how summer feels you know just that sort of happy twirling feeling um, uh, here's another one I shot this spring where it, it, the whole reason I chose that flower was those little curly things above the center of the flower. I just was fascinated by them. So these are the things that I'm looking for that make a flower different. Um, I could give you so, so many. Technical things. question while we're looking at that one. Yeah. Wait, I'm losing you. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. Oh, uh, go ahead. Can you hear me better? Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, where, where would you focus where would you place your your focus point on a, uh, on a the, the like center this? of the flower definitely yeah. yeah you determine what is the most important part okay you know we're talking about macro photography so you know even though I'm filling my frame to me there's a part of the flower that I want to lead your eye to first mm -hmm. and um, if we're talking compositionally I've I've composed this using the rule of thirds I, I assume you're all familiar with that um, so that I've put it, it, it it's not exact but you can't always be exact when you're working up close but I've put the the center of attention in the lower quadrant and I'm focusing on this center that's the part that's most critical to have in focus because that's where right. I'm going to lead your eye so um, I love it now there's another aspect of learning to see and this is something that um, I've been working on really hard over the last couple of years, really challenging myself. And this is where Lens Baby comes in. This is a Lens Baby Velvet um, image. And um, I can't say enough about Lens Baby. And I know you <laughs> feel the same way, Levi. I'm the same way. I am. I am. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> These lenses are amazing and they whenever I get in a creative slump or just want to play I pull out my lens babies I mean I use them on a regular basis but they're so much fun and the velvet oh my gosh I I can't say enough about that lens it is magic it's magic what it does so when you shoot in the lower app and because the aperture does not register um, on your uh, metadata because it's not controlled electronically with the camera, I can't tell you exactly what aperture this was, but it was probably right. F2. Yeah. Um, it goes down to one, F1.6, but believe me, if you shoot at F1.6, you don't get anything in focus. Right. F, it's, it's a different different kind of lens yeah so I tend to shoot between two and four um, because I'm usually going for a very soft focus look 
To me, this is a a very abstract, it's just an essence of a dahlia. Um, And that lens has this ethereal velvety quality when you shoot it at those lower apertures that to me, I got this up on my screen and I just almost cried because I was like, oh "Oh my gosh, (laughs) look what it did. And I shot this. I shot this indoors at a Dahlia show where the lighting was horrendous. <laughs> so that lens just pulls something out that's magical. So um, very little post-processing when you use Lens Baby. Um, I also mm-hmm. shoot with a composer um, mm-hmm. with a variety of optics um, and the macro converters. And um, right. those are marvelous lenses too. I know you use them too. Um, they're wonderful for flowers, but they really um, are. They really if, are. if you're, if you're really not into the whole post-processing thing and you like a softer look to your flowers, this is the lens to go with because this image, other than, um, just giving it a tiny punch in vibrance. Um, and I cloned out a little odd spot at the top. There was nothing else that I did to this. This is pretty much straight out of camera. So, Love it. Um, all right. Again, abstract. Um, this is, I don't very often do this. I don't turn my in black and white, but this, this rose to me was all about shadow and form and the color was really distracting. So the minute I turned it to black and white, it became what I saw in my head. Um, so, you know, it's fun to experiment with black and white, but again, this is a much more abstract vision of a flower. And this is something that, that I experiment with a lot. Um, another aspect of learning to see, and I mentioned this before, is working your subject, um, Mm -hmm. and shooting it in many different ways. This poppy, I started out shooting it from the top. And then the minute I got down low, I was actually laying on my stomach. I was hand holding this shot and I saw that curve of the stem. And to me, that t- tells a story about how poppies dance in the wind. Right. And I knew that was the shot. So, you know, if I had, if I'd only stopped with that one shot or two shots or whatever of the, the poppy head on, I would never have seen that beautiful stem. So work that subject and sometimes quick you question yep go do, ahead do you ever focus stack do you do you ever focus oh stack? that's focus a great stack? question that's a great question um i personally do not um and i've had so Good. many people Good. argue with me about this i've had people get into <laughs> really good arguments why aren't you focus stacking why are you shooting at f32 i because it know, looks good well <laughs> i Don't worry. I I know that there is lens diffraction that happens when you shoot in in those higher apertures. I don't worry about it because um, I feel that what you can do in post-processing, and and I'm going to show you this, will bring back the sharpness and the detail in the image if you're worried about that. Um, I also don't like my images super, super sharp. I like a little softness because that's the way I see flowers. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say that I would never try focus stacking because I learned that lesson um, with some other things that you never say never. You know, you leave yourself open to trying new things, but I haven't as yet tried it. It, it mm-hmm. just feels a little too, I don't know, overly technical so to technical. me. It does. It, it becomes a, a technical exercise and it's you have to sit there thinking about how things are changing as you change focus and, and changing your framing and, right. and, and now you're losing sight of the line and the form and the dancing and the wind that you were, you were looking for. Right. Exactly. I think it just kind of alters my creativity a little. So, you know, I, I, I think it's perfectly fine if that's your thing. I know a lot of people that, you know, as I said, I come more from the artistic side but I, a lot of a lot of my friends that are photographers are just very get very excited by technical stuff, and they're the perfect candidates for that. And they they get right. you know they love it and go for it. Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's a great tool, but it's just not one that I felt the need to use. So, 
Um, and and personally, often I'm disappointed if I try to make a super sharp picture because flowers don't don't have like you think those veins are going to be perfectly crystal clear and they're just not. They're yeah. They're not sharp. You know, like like you say, they just have an inherent softness about them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't. I mean, I don't think that our eyes truly see. Um, you know, in in those higher apertures, I think we we tend to see things in the real world as being a little soft, or maybe it's just my eyes. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I have to speak for myself on that one. But um, hey, Wes Wes is asking. Wes yes. Wes Maggio is oh, asking. Hey, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> Wes is asking if you ever um, augment the dew on the flowers. Oh, you mean with the spray bottle? Yes. Okay, that's a great question. And I get asked that all the time. Um, I tried that early on with my flower photography and it just didn't look natural to me. Um, I, I actually know people that take syringes and technically place water droplets. Really? Yeah, wow. um, I don't do that. I. I just use what nature really gives me. I just, the times that I've tried it, it's just not looked natural. So I don't do that. But I also am a person, and this is the crazy flower lady in me, but I also <laughs> shoot um, right after rainstorms. It's one of my favorite times to shoot. And this is, this flower on the screen is a perfect example of that. Um, I will oftentimes head to the garden when it's still raining and I'll take my umbrella and I'll just kind of wait. And if you wait um, until the, the rain stops and the sky brightens, because you, you know, I mean, we, we can hopefully have a little time to talk about light because that's such an essential part of flower photography. But if you wait for that moment when the sky brightens a little bit, but you still have bright overcast, it's a marvelous time to, yes. to photograph flowers because this is what you get. You get the raindrops that nature has provided. So, um, yeah, so I don't do that, but I saw somebody Good. in the garden the other day carrying a huge spray bottle around. <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep my kit pretty simple. Um, That's good. Um, well, two, just, two more quick shooting questions for okay. you. Um, do you ever, do you bracket, do you use HDR to finish these? No, I do not. Not, not for okay. flowers. Um, but I do bracket aperture a lot um, because... <laughs> When I teach classes, I talk about this. I call it my insurance policy. Um, I, you know, I shoot an aperture priority, and oftentimes, you know, I may know about because I do know my lenses really well. I've been doing this for a while. I may know that okay, I want to shoot this flower at f11, um, but. I don't want to get home and get it on the big screen and find that a petal is out of focus that I wanted to be in focus. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can check the back of your camera, but it's not always as accurate as seeing it on the big screen. So, so I bracket, I might start at F9 and shoot all the way up to F14 just to make sure. Um, I don't want to get home and miss a shot and, if we have time, I can show you a perfect example of that. Oh, good. Um, it's easier to add softness than to add sharpness in an area that was out of focus. Exactly. That's that's a really good point. Um, just one more point about this whole idea of learning to see is, you know, I, I've talked a little bit about seeing stories in your images. And, you know, again, it's not going to be everything you should do. Sometimes I'm just trying to draw your eye to the beautiful you know, patterns and, and details of flowers. But when I find an image that has a story that just evokes something in me, it may not be the same story you see, but um, that becomes really special to me. And I just shot this a couple of days ago. I got really excited when I came across these two coneflowers and I loved the way the smaller coneflower was reaching up and touching the larger one. And it just, it, to me, I look for these interactions between flowers because they tell little stories and they add character and interest to an image. So, you know, 
people might see totally different stories in this. To me, it evoked, it, it just it was really strong because when my youngest daughter was a baby, she could not sit in my lap without reaching up and playing with my hair. Or when she was <laughs> nursing, she played with my hair. And it just brought back that memory for me of, you know, of it, this very tender gesture. So I look for those stories. Um, this is another one where I saw a story um, I, I was fascinated by the way this petal was just hanging on by a, a thread. And yeah. it reminded me, there was a little bit of tension in it because it reminded me of when you lose a tooth when you're a child. <laughs> and that feeling of excitement, you know, it's just hanging there and I got to pull it. Um, it, but I showed this to a friend of mine. I actually put it on Facebook and her response just floored me. Cause, and, and this is what I love because she saw something totally different. She said, oh, that reminds me of Rhett Butler offering his hand to Scarlett O'Hara to <laughs> dance. And my friend loves to dance. So of course she saw that story. But you know, that's that's the thing. I'm looking for stories, whether they're my stories or, or other people's stories. Um, and I think that's what makes really special images. So Excellent. it's all part of that art of seeing. So. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, one. Whoops. Wait, I, I lost you again. <laughs> there I go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Before we get into post processing, when you're when you're shooting, and and I I don't mean to keep di distracting from the vision no. No, idea, no, no, no. but and we've we've loved what you've been saying about the artfulness of things. Um, when you're shooting, what things do you do to help control color and um, color management while you're shooting? That's a good question. Actually, I do very little. Um, I find that, and I don't know if this is, you know, I'm not trying to put a plug in for Canon by Shoot Canon. I find that my colors are pretty right on and I do very uh -huh. little um, work on color and post-processing. Um, I do sometimes underexpose a little bit when I'm working mm -hmm. with reds and um, fuchsia colors because they can get Tulips really- Tulips get me every time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just underexpose a stop or so. And, okay. um, and, you know, that seems to do it. But on the whole, I don't have a whole lot of problems with that. Um, Good. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. Very good. Well, let, let me, um, let's pause for station identification okay. and then we'll switch to post-processing. So while okay. you get your post-processing ready, I will remind everybody how okay. they can enter the drawing because this Hangout is sponsored by Perfectly Clear and Drobo. And Perfectly Clear creates wonderful tools for helping us finish our photographs. Um, and it, it does a, a better, faster job of it than... I can do in Lightroom and and I'm you know I'm pretty good in Lightroom and and perfectly clear does it better and faster than I can get it done and uh, so we're we're giving away a license for perfectly clear complete today as well as two licenses for perfect eyes which are is a marvelous tool for uh, working with portraits in particular and also we're brought to you today by Drobo which is a system of of hard drive tools that allow you to simply back up your pictures so that when your hard drives fail, because they will fail, uh, when they fail, you will not have lost all the data on them uh, because the, the Drobo automatically backs everything up for you. And it's, it's really a, a powerful way to work and it's simple. I just plug it in and it backs up my pictures and I sleep better at night. And uh, so we're glad that Perfectly Clear and Drobo are both bringing us to bringing uh, bringing Anne here with us today, so that we can we can learn from her. We're really enjoying this, Anne. Oh, I am too. There's... This is lovely, Anne. You discovered a flower on the underside of a flower. I've already learned something. <laughs> what else? Uh, let's see. I enjoy taking flower shots too, but it's hard to be different. And you've been telling us, you've been showing us some ideas for releasing our vision so that we can be different and yes. unique. Yes. Um, and you've already told us some, some great macro lenses to choose. What, what one lens would you 
not live without? Oh, gosh. Um, that's, you know, that's a very personal choice for people. Um, I, I guess my 100 millimeter, I think, is probably the most versatile. Now, other flower photographers right. would, would argue with that. Um, a lot of people prefer mm -hmm. the 180 because they like to be back a little further from their subjects. And um, the 180 is wonderful for compressing your background and controlling your background. And I'm using it more and more and getting more excited about the images I'm getting with that lens. But I'd say if, if I only had to choose one lens it would be the hundred millimeter because I can hand hold it for a lot of things that I can't hand hold the 180 um, right. it has the image stabilization and I I personally like being up close and personal with my images mm -hmm. I, I don't you know I, I don't like being limited by having to shoot further back um, so, I, you know, there are times when I need to be further back. If a flower is set back in a garden, I obviously can't get to it with the 100 millimeters. So it, it would be hard for me to live without either. But, right. and then of, of yeah, course. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the 90 to 100, 105 are, are really terrific. And, and they've got the benefit of being image stabilized. They're, they've got the yeah. vibration reduction and, and optical stabilization and whatever other things they call it built yeah. into the lens. So those are, those are pretty handy tools. Yeah. But I'm finding it harder and harder to live without my lens baby. So um, that I would not want to give up either. And and they're less right. expensive. So if you're they just, are. you know, and, and there's other options. If you don't want to invest in a in a macro lens, you can do extension tubes. You can do a close up mm -hmm. filter to put on the front of your. You know, there's. Um, I won't go yeah, into fifteen that. or twenty dollars. You can you can get started with some of those tools. Yeah, you you can get in. You it allows you to get in close. So, you know, if you're not sure this is your genre, um, that that might be a safe route to take. And the the lens baby is what five hundred dollars as opposed to the most expensive one is five hundred dollars. Yeah, as opposed to a thousand bucks for a hundred millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah so. Um, well, and, and if you're if you're going to invest that much in a lens, you should you should call lensrentals.com and and rent one first. Exactly. Uh, I don't, yeah. What does the 180 cost? Is it like 1500? Uh, well, the Tamron, no, it know. was like I think 799 maybe. It's very reasonable. The Canon really? version yeah. is probably twice that. Um, yeah. Which which actually I want to rent that and just try it and compare it. But I've been extremely happy with the Tamron. I think it's a great sharp lens. Um, so right. I have no complaints. Um, well, well, shall good. We well, yes. Let's dig in. Show us what you do. Okay. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my okay, glasses. You're gonna, you're gonna show us a picture of a dandelion, and it's gonna turn into a dahlia, isn't it? That's <laughs> yeah. that's a lovely post processing. Is that yeah. right? Now you you can see my my screen, right? With the water yes. lily. Okay. All right. I just took this actually a week ago. I'm trying to show some new work as opposed to older images. So, all right. The first thing you have to know, we, we haven't had a chance to talk about light, which is really, really essential for flower photography. And if you don't understand light, um, you know, come to one of my classes so I can teach you. Um, you really want that soft, diffuse light. Um, you know, you, we can work around it with using diffusers by working in the shade, but your best light is when you have that bright overcast. That's when I only shoot water lilies um, because I can't diffuse yeah. them. They're out in aquatic ponds. And this mm -hmm. is the one time where I don't use a macro. I use a 70 to 300 to get in close. Um, but, you know, usually your best light is going to be early morning and late afternoon or early evening. That's when you're going to get that beautiful, yummy, impactful light. But water lilies I have to shoot in the middle of the day because that's when they're open. They don't open mm -hmm. until about 9 o'clock and they close about 3 o'clock, most of them, not all. Um, so I'm limited to middle of the day. I can't shoot them on a bright sunny day i have to wait for bright overcast that's when i go do my water lilies so you can see now this is um i'm showing you the the raw image with lightroom adjustments now i'm just gonna toggle off whoops uh oh wait a minute i, I didn't oh, do that. go to develop yeah go to the develop module oh, I was and then in the develop press, module. yeah right. then when you press the backslash key it'll show you yes. before and after 
Ugh, I forgot to move into develop. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, you can see that's pretty dull. I mean, when we shoot raw, which I do, we have to add a little pizzazz to our. This one was a little underexposed, which I tend to do with water lilies, but it, it needs some help. It's, it's kind of dull. So this is what I did in Lightroom. Let me open the panel back up here. Um, all right, you can see. I have worked, I've just added a little tad of contrast, just a tad, just plus 10. Um, I have increased my clarity, which I use, I only use the clarity slider when I'm trying to pull out detail. For soft focus images, nope, you don't want to go near that slider. No, no way. Um, no, in fact, you could even take it the other direction if you want to make it softer. I've popped my vibrance up to 25, just to bring out a little well, color. That that whites control that you lifted there. Oh, is, oh yes, yes, really yes, that's the absolutely yeah. most that's... important thing. I learned this from Tim Gray. If you've ever heard Tim Gray speak, he will talk yeah. about the white and the black point. And I do this for every single image. So basically, let, let me show you how that's done. Oops, let's um, let it go back. All right, so this, I don't usually use the exposure slider at all. I go straight to the, um, the whites um, uh, slider. So if you press down on a Mac, it's your option key, um, and move your slider to the right, the white slider to the right, until your highlights begin to pop, and then you back it off. And, and it's, the, it's the alt key on a, on a PC. Thank you, I have never used a PC. So, so you back it off and then you look at it. That's a little bright for me, so I'm gonna back it off just a tiny bit more. I think I was at 60, but that's good enough. Um, so yes, I always set that white point and it's changed my processing. That's probably the most yeah. important thing I do in Lightroom. And then I also check the black point. I don't use that as much in this one. I didn't alter it at all. Um, it was pretty much the way my blacks were just where I wanted them to be. Um, and then I think in the hue saturation, I popped my purple just a tiny bit, saturated it a little bit more. And I sharpen, but I do it by masking. Um, and again, you use that option key and just sharpen the part of the image that you want sharp. Um, I don't need the right. water. I don't need the water to be sharpened, um, just the flower itself. So that's... Um, that's how I handle sharpening. And then um, I always, you know, do the chromatic, the, the lens corrections, the chromatic aberrations, the, um, those corrections. And then oftentimes, let's see what I did with this one. Yes, I did use the dehaze. That dehaze oh, yeah. slider, when, when Lightroom first introduced that, I thought, oh, how nice for landscape photographers. <laughs> you know, I thought that, that has no use for flower photography. But actually, it works a lot like the clarity slider or the contrast slider. It just adds a little pop. So, you know, again, when I'm working with images that I want to bring out more detail, sometimes I will use that that slider too. Not not <coughs> always, but it's it's something fun to play yeah. with. So. Um, Would you show us the before and after with the dehaze? dehaze? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Hold on. You have to understand, I'm using my laptop, which I usually don't process on, so right. it's a wireless mouse. Okay, so, you know, it, you can see it just it just adds a tiny bit of There pop. it goes, yeah. Yeah. All right, That's so great. this, this yeah. image, this is Lightroom, um, and this image is perfectly fine the way it is, but... Let me go to the finished image and show you how I finished it. Um, I just added a little more detail and pop. And how I did this, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it this finished image. I'm gonna show the, you the original. Um, this is a TIFF um, in Photoshop and show you the layers um, and what I do with Nick software. Um, so you can see. I have one layer here, and that's Color FX Pro, which is part of the the Google Nix uh, suite. There are seven different programs. Which is now free. Which is free. So <laughs> if you don't have it, download it. Now um, I'm going to turn this off, 
And I'm going to open Color Ethics Pro and show you what filters I used on this image to do that. So um, now I do, first of all, in my background layer, um, I clean up my image. I either duplicate the background if it's excessive cleaning or I just, you know, if it's a little spot healing. I do that all in Photoshop. I know you can do that in Lightroom, but I'm just sort of old school. I prefer the cloning and the spot healing tool in Lightroom. But I am obsessive about getting rid of dirt spots because I think they really draw your eye away. And I was going to um, ask you because there's always spider webs on my flowers. Yeah, well... <laughs> Um, yeah, I would, well, it depends. I mean, if that's part of your story, leave it in, but, um, all right. So this is opening in Color FX Pro and you can see it opened in a filter called Detail Extractor, which was the last filter that I used it. This software is so intuitive. It, it's, it, I don't think I ever even watched a video on how to use it. I just figured it out. It's so easy. Um, you can see that um, I use these filters very, very sparingly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, the detail extractor, and I'm going to move it up until I feel I've kind of got my image where I want it. It's going to pull out detail. Now look what happens when I go way to the right. It, it gets right. crazy. You don't want to do that. So I tend to go between 10 and 20. That's usually my limit. Um, here, I'm going to say about 20 is where I want to be. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I did. Um, contrast, I'm pretty happy with my contrast. I'm not going to really worry about that. And saturation, I've already worked on that in Lightroom. So that is kind of all I'm going to do. But you can see there's a little button up here, compare. And you can just see how it pulls out a slight bit more detail in the flower. Um, just really kind of brings out some of those lines and shadows and, and such. Um, all right, now I can apply this globally by just hitting OK, or I can apply it selectively by hitting this brush tool. And what it'll do is it'll go back into Photoshop, create a layer with a mask, and I'll use the brush tool and brush it in where I want it. Now, cool. sometimes the detail extractor will really mess up your backgrounds. In this one, it's not. So I would just apply it globally. It's not doing anything unpleasant to the image. So I'm just going to apply it globally. But before I do that, I'm going to stack another layer on here. I'm going to add a filter by pressing this button. And this is my other second favorite. I use, I only use about two or three, maybe four filters in ColorFX Pro. And these are the two that I use the most. Um, the second one is called Dark and Light and Center. And what this does is it creates a pop of light where you want to place it, and then it vignettes your borders. And you can control exactly how much light and exactly how much vignetting. And I do this because I want your eye to be drawn to the middle of, the, of this um, water lily. So I take this Place Center button, and whoops, sometimes it doesn't always want to cooperate. All right, come on, guys. There we go. Hey, it's okay. free. Yeah, <laughs> it's free. That's right. Okay, and then I, did you see what happened? When I placed it in the center, it brightened the center. And then I can mm -hmm. go over here and I can, I can increase that, but I, I like where it is right now. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to brighten that too much more. Um, and then the border luminosity controls what happens with the vignetting. If I want it to be a darker border, I can slide it to the left. If I want to keep it more open and not vignette too much, I slide it to the right. The lily pad to me, I want that to be part of my composition, so I don't want to darken it too much. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it there, but let's compare. I'm going to press this compare. You can see how that draws the eye in both by pulling the detail out with that detail extractor and then adding that pop of light. Yeah, and that's marvelous. Yeah, so that's all I do. That is it. The other, um, the other program I like in, um, in 
the NIC software is Viveza. It does some very similar things. There's a structure slider that um, will help pull out detail. And sometimes I use that mm -hmm. instead of color FX. Um, but those are, um, and then black and white, if you're doing anything in black and white, the Silver FX Pro is another great program. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna cancel this out because I've actually already finished the image and turn that back on. So that's my finished image. That is all I did in post-processing. Um, that's now great. One, one of the reasons that, you know, simplifying your composition, moving in close, you don't have to do a lot of post-processing because I don't have backgrounds to really worry about. Um, For sure. Yeah. So, um, okay. How are we doing on time? We are, we are wrapping up. And okay. as we wrap up here, I want to remind folks that this is your last chance to leave us a comment, say thanks to Anne, say uh, nice flowers, something, and uh, just leave us a comment in the Q&A section. And that will enter you in the drawing for perfectly clear, which is well, it's it's a great way to finish flower for for your flowers. So I'm gonna, I definitely want to try it. I'm gonna, I'm actually going to download it to to see what it does for flowers. Um, and and there's the free version called Perfect Exposure that that is free forever for everybody here. Just go to athentech.com, A-T-H-E-N-T-E-C-H.com, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna help you. Um, it's gonna help you. Uh, and uh, John John says he's been putting together an electric fan because it's it's thirty five degrees in the UK, which is like I don't know. He's probably cooking up there at, at almost ninety degrees right now, so. He's looking forward to the replay. Me too. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this all again and, and garner all these tips. We've we've learned about vision. We've learned about uh, how to shoot with what lenses to use and what uh, what what tools we can use to make great flower pictures. And we've learned how to finish these pictures really well. I I can't thank you enough, uh, oh. and for for everything you've done for us here today. Well, it was it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it and. You know, I wish we'd had more time because I have so much more I could say. <laughs> and so well, much we'll just have to have you on again, and okay. we'll, we'll pick up from from where we stopped here. I would um, love in fact, Anne, hit your stop screen sharing button so we can stop to your face again. Yes, I'm and, sorry, uh, I, I closed. There I am. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're we're glad you're here. Every, Anthony says thanks. Beautiful shots. Great info. Um, thanks, Anne. Abriano. Chimed in there, Chung Kim. Uh, oh, excellent I know Chung. Hi, Chung. <laughs> oh, good. She's my new Thanks friend. Jeff, She's... Jeff Ross wants you back. Oh, oh. Chung's your new friend? Oh, excellent. excellent. Yeah, she's coming to out of New York, so. Oh, good. Yeah, I'll be, presenting, I'll be presenting at the out of New York conference in October, so um, I'm Where excited. Where do we find out information about that? Um, well, at outofchicago.com. Um, I'm very much involved in, well, as you know, Levi, <laughs> Levi's very involved in Out of Chicago too. I'm part of the, the team behind Out of Chicago, but I'm also a presenter. Um, and we have a lot of exciting things. We just finished our summer conference, which Le Which Levi's, was marvelous. Oh, man. oh it, it's, it's like no other conference you ever go to. And we have our New York conference coming up October 14th through 16th um, in the heart of Manhattan. It's going to be super exciting. And, um, and then Excellent. we're planning... We're planning all sorts of uh, conferences all over the country, maybe the world. And we have Acadia National Park coming in October of 2017. I'm involved in that. And so lots of great stuff. So, uh, yeah, get on Chicago, get on outofchicago.com and learn more about what we're about because it, it is it's a really exciting group. Yeah, uh, it's it's a it's the I always say it's the shootingest conference on the planet. It is. Everybody gets to shoot and make pictures and and have fun. I mean, it is just a fun place to learn. It's a blast. So, it's it's yeah. one. It's unique in that um, presenters and participants really um, have a, spend a lot of time together. 
Right. And you really get to know people. And there's just a, even though it's, it's a, I, I think we had 400 this year, which is the largest conference yet, but it still has a very intimate um, feel to it. It's just the friendliest, the friendliest conference on earth, honestly. The friendliest, shittiest. It really is. It, it really is. is. I've been to a lot of conferences. And, and Levi is part of, of why it's that way, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're the friendliest well, person on me. earth. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, and where where can we see the rest of your work? Where can we uh, catch um, up with you? Well, I am. I have a, a website, um, annbelmontphotography.com, and I have a lot of stuff up there. Um, and um, I blog. I usually blog about the garden, but I give a lot of tips in my blog posts. And then I'm on Instagram. Um, and Facebook, just um, Instagram is Ann Belmont ph Photography too. I'm relatively new to Instagram, but I love it. It's a great place for photography. I do. I do love your Instagram. Yeah, I, I love. I love having those. So much for joining us, Ann. I am drawing from our winners here, from our entrants. Yay! And uh, first, we'll draw for the winner for the. Uh, full version of perfectly clear complete and to to claim your prize all you need to do is send me an email levi at photofocus.com and i will send you a uh, license code for the software and our first winner is martina gordon martina are you still here leave us another question to tell me you're still in the house and uh, and thank you for joining us and so martina you won And our next winner is Jeff Ross for a license for perfect eyes. Jeff, are you still here? Let me know by leaving another question or, or just a comment saying you're here. And our last one, the winner of the uh, perfect eyes, and another license for perfect eyes is Carmen Mandich in Spain. So, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Wow. Here, and you've got, you, you guys have just a, a moment to, to do that because I want to. Uh, well, Jeff is still here. Great, Jeff, you're in. Just send me an email and I'll send you your license code. And then we're looking for Carmen and Martina. And folks, I've got to get on the plane. I'm afraid we're. I'm. I'm headed down to Photoshop <laughs> World today. We got to get. Uh, we got to get Levi to the that's airport. Right. That's right. So I'm going to start drawing another name if if Martina and Carmen don't weigh in here shortly. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm going to see Chris Smith down there. He's the, yes. the originator of, of out of Chicago too. And if anybody yes. watching is coming down to to. Uh, Photoshop world, please look me up. We're having a we're having a reader's breakfast on Thursday morning and also a party at or excuse me, Wednesday morning for the reader's breakfast and a party at the pinball hall of fame that you guys have just got to come join us for. It is it, it is a like really so fun evening. Fun. <laughs> yeah. And Carmen and Martina, you're both here. Thank you guys so much for for joining us. And we can't thank you enough for for being here. We're going to have to have you back on because we only okay. scraped the surface of, of what you've, you've got to oh, share with we us. Did. So. We did. I would love to. Thank you, everyone. It was really my pleasure. I love teaching more than anything. So, Excellent. And, yeah, one more time, Carmen. Levi, L-E-V-I, at photofocus.com. Right there you can see my uh, photo focus is P-H-O-T-O-F-O-C-U-S. And just send me an email, guys, and I'll send you your license for um perfectly clear uh lori says she's here but she's on a work conference call thanks lori you didn't win <laughs> but we'll catch you next time lori. and thanks everybody for tuning in we'll see you back here on august 1st when we're going to hear from jeff stevens he's going to teach us about the lies our cameras are telling us and how to correct them well, how to, how to recover our pictures from the problems our cameras are adding. It's really an interesting discussion, and uh, I'm excited to see you guys here on August 1st. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everybody else. Thank we'll catch you. you next time. Thanks, Levi. Have a safe trip. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.